I want to get right to it this morning. I don't want to appeal to your hearts. I want to appeal to your minds. Now, I'm going to challenge your thinking, especially in the last part of it. And I think, Pastor, if you don't already, I'll have all my notes, PowerPoint, and all the background support material, everything on the website by Tuesday of the church. And you can download it all free. I'm not going to give a talk this morning. I'm going to tell you a story. A story about an 11-year-old boy who woke up one morning and didn't want to live anymore. It's my story. Have you ever been lonely? Ever felt all alone? No. Have you ever had that, just that fleeting thought? It wouldn't matter to anyone if you lived or you died. That's how I felt at 11 years old, and I just wanted to die. I was brought up in a town a lot smaller than Burnett, about 1,800 people. And growing up, my father was a town alcoholic. I hardly ever knew him sober until I was 20 years old. I'd go to high school, and my friends would make jokes about my father downtown in the gutter making a fool of himself. They didn't think it bothered me. Why? Because I'm like some of you, and you know who you are. Where you can laugh on the outside when you're crying on the inside. I never let anyone know how much those jokes hurt, even my closest friends. I lived on a farm. And I'd go out to the barn, and I'd see my mother, who I loved so much, lying in the gutter manure behind the cows, or my father being drunk, yanked the air hose off the milk pipes, and would beat my mother to a bloody pulp. Until she was so bloody and weak, she couldn't stand up in it. Nine, 10, 11 years old, I'd be beating on my dad and kicking him and saying, when I'm strong enough, I'll kill you. We'd have friends come over. And if you have an alcoholic parent, or if you are an alcoholic parent, then trust me, every day your kids carry that shame. We're good at hiding it. But any child of an alcoholic carries that shame with them every day of their life. Especially when friends would come over and in my case, your dad would be drunk. So before they'd arrive, I'd go out to the barn. My dad would either be passed out or halfway there. And I'd grab him around the legs, pull him up, and pull him into a pen where the cows would have their calves. And I'd drop him on the straw, and then I'd go back the car out, because you learn to drive young on the farm, and back the car out and park it up behind the barn so nobody could see it. And then we'd tell friends, well, he had to go away an important call so we wouldn't be shamed. Casey woke up before I left. I'd go back out there and... Now, he was a little man, but I was just a little kid, nine, ten years old. But I'd get down under him, and I'd get my shoulder into him up against the boards and put an arm through a board like this and tie the rope. Then get my other shoulder into him and get his arm through the board and tie the rope there. And then I'd go outside the pen behind him with another rope, and I'd make a hangman's noose. And I'd put it around his neck at nine years old. And I'd put the other end of the rope around his feet. And as a little kid, as much as I could pull it, I wouldn't, to his head would go all the way over that top board. When I couldn't pull it anymore, I'd wrap it around his legs and then knot it. And I remember the first time I did that. I left him there about 6 o'clock at night, went out the next morning about 5.30. And I was so disappointed, so discouraged. He was still alive. All I ever wanted as a kid, all I ever wanted for Christmas, was for my dad to quit hurting my mother and I couldn't stop him, and I grew up with the guilt that it was my fault because I wasn't strong enough. So when I went to the university, I was bitter, I was hurt, I was mad. And then more than that, from 6 to 13 years of age for 7 years, every week, sometimes 2-3 times a week, for 7 years, I was homosexually raped by a man with the name of Wayne Bailey in my own home. When I was six years old, he was hired to be a worker on the farm, to be a housekeeper and a cook. And when my mother would go out to the fields to work or go downtown to shop or something, and my parents would go away from the weekend, my mother would always make me stand in front of Wayne Bailey. In her harsh fa farm voice, she would say, Josh, you obey Wayne. If you're disobedient, you're going to get a whipping when I get home. What would you do at six, seven, eight, nine years old? You do what Wayne Bailey tells you. At about nine years old, I was playing football, tossing bales of hay, became rather strong. My parents went downtown shopping. This man came up behind me, put his arm on my right shoulder, 
and I spun around and I cut my hands around his throat, pushed him up against the wall, and I said, if you ever touch me again, I will kill you. And I really think I would have. And again, when I was nine years old, I went to my mother. Oh, it took, oh, I was so scared. I went into the kitchen to tell her, and she was doing dishes, looking out the window with her back towards me. And I walked up behind her, and I told her what was happening. She turned around. Oh, she was mad at me. She yelled at me, and she said, I did not raise you to lie. She made me go out to the willow tree in the backyard and break off a switch, take my shirt off, and for 30 minutes she whipped me. Till finally I cried out, I'm lying, I'm lying, I'm lying. That was the darkest day of my life. That's when I lost all hope and became, I had despair. That's when I became a fighter. It was my only way of survival. I can still feel the fear of that day, feeling all alone. I knew what was being done to me was evil and I couldn't stop it. My own parents wouldn't. And I was so afraid. That's when I became afraid of men. I became afraid to ever be in a room alone with a man. So when I went into the university, I was bitter. I hated God. I hated my dad. I hated the church. I hated the Bible. And I hated Christians. These Christians say, well, don't you? They knew my background, so they say, well, you know, there's a Heavenly Father who loves you. That didn't bring joy. That brought pain. I could not discern the difference between a Heavenly Father and an earthly father. I grew up believing fathers hurt. My dad hurt me. And I couldn't bridge that gap between an earthly father and a Heavenly Father. And in the university... I saw this small group of people, there weren't very many, there were eight students, two faculty, one of sociology, one of history, and their lives were different. They seen, you ever seen a group of people kind of stand out? Now, most people do it because they're weird. But these people kind of stood out because I saw that they seemed to have a genuine, I mean genuine love and care for each other. Now, you'll find that everywhere. But you know what was different? And this caught my attention. They seemed to have that same authentic love for people outside their group. The way I was raised, that was weird. So I made friends with them. We were sitting around the table in the student union. And I looked over at this young lady. Oh, she was cute. I used to think all Christians were ugly. I really did. I figured if you couldn't make it anywhere else in the world or in life, you became a believer. But she was really cute, and I didn't expect that. And I had a problem. And it was a serious problem for me, literally. I wanted what they had. But I didn't want them to know that I wanted what they had. But all the time, they knew that I wanted what they had and didn't want them to know that I wanted what they had. So I leaned back in my chair and probably with a very arrogant attitude. I just said, tell me, what changed your lives? Why are you so different? The other students, the faculty. All I know is she had a lot of courage or a lot of guts. She shot back at me and didn't even smile. She said, Mr., we didn't tell you religion, the church, the Bible, anything. We told you the person of Jesus Christ. And I said, I am sick and tired of the Bible, of church, of God, of Christians and Christianity. She said, we told you the person of Jesus Christ. Ouch. I apologize to him. But I attached to my apology this disclaimer. I want you to understand something. I want absolutely nothing to do with God, the Bible, the church, Christians, or Christianity. Then they challenged me as a pre-law student, now get this, to intellectually, <laughs> to, to use my mind, boy, I thought that was a joke, to use my mind to examine two things. One, the Bible is being true, and boy, will I talk about that this afternoon. You're going to be able to do something that only one-tenth of one percent of believers in all of history has been able to do. Literally this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Going to do something that's only been done maybe three times in all of history in, Texas, in the state of Texas. And you're going to want to bring your camera. But they challenged me to prove that the Bible was true in the Word of God. I thought you're going to be kidding with that one. And second, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. 
Well, they kept challenging me. In fact, they just ticked me off. Now, don't get it wrong. What those Christians were doing was totally appropriate. I was the problem. From the time I walked out where I locked myself in a shelled corn bin and came out when I slid that door open and the sunlight hit me in the face, I damned God, my dad, everything for abandoning me. So I left the university, traveled throughout the United States, England, Germany, France, Switzerland, the Middle East, to gather the evidence, yeah, in fact, to write this book, huge one, to write that book, to make a joke of those professors and students. I returned to London, England the night before I had to fly back, and I was sitting in a small museum library checking out some manuscripts. And I leaned back in my chair, cut my head, hands behind my head, and right in front of everyone, which is probably three people, I said, it's true. It's true. It's true. Now, what I meant by that, as an obnoxious, angry, ornery, agnostic university student, I had intellectually come to the conclusion that I could hold, starting with the New Testament in my hand, and say what I have is what was written down. And what was written down was true. Now at that time, I, what I meant by what was written down was true. I had concluded that what, it was true that it was written down. I hadn't yet come to the conclusion that what was written down was true. Do you see the difference? I concluded, yes, it's true. This was written down. Jesus did do this. But I hadn't yet concluded, well, is it true what was written down? I returned to the university. I couldn't sleep. Because for the first time in my life, I knew I was being intellectually dishonest. Because this is what I'd found, a piece of evidence. Now what I'm gonna share with you here is just a little tiny piece. There were seven major things that hit me intellectually. But this is one of the top three. It's something very few people speak on. And you're, I'm gonna, you're not gonna be able to take notes on it. It doesn't look like you're taking notes anyway. I just don't understand people going to church not taking notes. <laughs> I just, because when you walk out within 10 minutes, you've forgotten 90% of what you hear. Uh, but you'll be able to go to the website Tuesday. I believe they can have it all up there. You can download everything that I do. I want to touch on one little piece of evidence. And it's this. In Luke 24, the disciples weren't getting it. They were a little hard-headed. They were from the hill country. And they just didn't get it. And Jesus said to him, guys, don't you get it? Everything that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It said he would go into the synagogue and open the scriptures and explain to them himself from the scriptures. Messianic prophecy. The Old Testament written over a period of a thousand years. Completed right about 500 B.C contains 333 prophecies, and they'll be on the website, all documented, everything. You can download all 333 of them. All fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ, 500 years after they were written down. And the university professor said, oh, come on, McDowell, that's ridiculous. They weren't written down these prophecies until the time of Jesus or after Christ, so they coincide with his life. I said, that sounds pretty good, unless you want to think. I said, look, the Septuagint. The Septuagint is name given to the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It contains all the prophecies. It was initiated, historically documented 250 years before Christ. So you don't have to have the whole little slice to realize. If 250 years before Christ, you have the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament contains all the prophecies, you get the same problem you'd have with 500 years. Now I'm gonna go through just a small handful of these prophecies. And I'm going to do it in God writing an address. Do you know your address separates you from 7.3 billion people alive today? Think of that. Even General Delivery Burnett, Texas, separates you from 7.3 billion people in the world. Well, in the same way, God wrote an address. He did it through prophecy to identify his son from all history, past, present, or future, as the Messiah, the Son of God. Now in presenting this, I, I use a little different technique. 
I'm going to speak probably faster than you've almost heard anyone speak, especially from Texas. I probably won't speak quite as fast as a good auctioneer. But I'm going to speak so fast that if you were taking notes, you wouldn't be able to take notes, but you can go to the website and download it all. Because I want you to get the impact of it. You can get the content on, on the church website, say, by Tuesday. I'm going to sit down doing this. Now, normally I have to be walking, but I have a limited time this morning. And so I'm going to sit down doing this, which means I might make a mistake. But I'm going to try it one out of three times I can beat the computer. One out of three times I can do it fast enough to beat the computer. Now, here is God's address to identify his son. And this is what I struggled with as a non-believer. We'll go all the way back before recorded time in Genesis. It says that the indication of who the Messiah be, be born in the seed of the woman. Everybody else in the Bible is referred to as the seed of the man. Why the seed of the woman, the virgin birth? Then we'll go down to recorded time. Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Every nation in the world can be traced back to one of these three individuals. Did you realize that? Now God eliminates two-thirds of the nations of the world when he says that my son will be of the lineage of the... <laughs> Seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem. Now, within the lineage of Shem, he, he eliminated two-thirds of the nations of the world. He called a man out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And now God narrows it down further. He says, you know who my son is because he was born of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, and the descendants of Abraham. Now, Abraham had eight children. Now, God eliminates seven-eighths of the children and the descendants of Abraham. And he says, you know who my son is because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, and the light of Isaac. Now, Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. Now, God eliminates 50%. See the probability building up? 50% of the line of Isaac. When he says, you know who my son is because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, and the line of Isaac, and the line of Jacob. Now, Jacob had 12 children. Now, which developed the 12 tribes of Israel. Now God eliminates the 11 tolls of the tribes of Israel when he says, you know who my son is because he'd be born in the seed of the woman, the Shem, the of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, and the tribe of Judah. Now within the tribe of Judah, there are many family lines, hundreds of family lines. Now God eliminates every single family line but one when he says, you know who my son is because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, the Shem, the of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the family of Jesse. Now Jesse had eight children. Now God eliminates seven eighths of the family line of Jesse when he says, you know who my son is because he be born of the seed of the woman, Lean Shem, descendants of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, child of Judah, and a family of Jesse in the house of David. Then we go down about 1012 BC in Psalm 22 with a very unusual prophecy. When he says, You know who the, my, my son is? Because he's born of the seed of the woman, Lean Shem, descendants of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, child of Judah, family of Jesse, house of David, and he'll be crucified. His hands and feet would be pierced against the tree. Say, Oh, come on, McDowell, thousands were crucified. Yeah, but do you realize historically that method of crucifixion was not put into 800 years? years after the prophecy, then God narrows it down further. In one day, about 25 to 30 prophecies fulfilled. Here's just a handful of them. When he says, you know who my son is, because he'd be born. The see the woman, Lean Shem, Son, Abraham, Line of Isaac, Line of Jacob, Travis, Judah, Family, Jesse, House of David, be crucified, betrayed by a friend, 30 piece, not 29.99, 30 pieces of silver, not gold, police on the table, not thrown on the floor, in the temple, and used to buy a burial plot. And then God narrows it down further. He eliminates every single city in the world for a son's entry in humanity. He says, you know who my son is, because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, Lean Shem, Son, Zavir, Milan, Amai, Lion, Jacob, Travis, Judah, family, Jesse, House of David, be crucified, betrayed by a friend, 30 pieces of silver, thrown floor, in the temple, used to buy a potter's field, and then be born in the entrance into humanity in the tiny city of Bethlehem, Afraida. Do you realize that prophecy was made, not even a thousand people lived in Bethlehem, Afraida? And a professor in the university said, oh, come on, McDowell, if God was that great, he could tell you when it would happen. I said, he did. In Malachi 3.1, you might call it Malachi, but in Malachi 3.1, God says, you know who my son is, because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, the Shem, the of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the family of Jesse, the house of David, be crucified, betrayed by a friend, 30 pieces of silver, thrown from in the temple, used to buy a potter's field, and be born in the city of Bethlehem, and it'll all take place before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. When did that happen? 70 A.D. 300, when I do all 333, it takes an hour and 15 minutes. 333 prophecies all fulfilled in one person. As the professor said, and there's nothing can be said so dumb that couldn't be said in the university. He said, oh, come on, McDowell, it's all a coincidence. I said, really? I said, Dr. Peter Stoner, a scientist, wrote a book called Science Speaks. When he became a believer, he was very intrigued with these prophecies. So he took the modern science of probability, 
to figure out the probability just for eight, just eight of the 300 and some prophecies, just eight of them that could be written down before the person was born and fulfilled in their life. It came out to one, to every t one times 10, to the seventh teenth power. That's 10 with 17 zero. Now, if you understand that, you understand our national debt. <laughs> Even though it's 10 times greater than that, it's 114 trillion, actually. But how do you picture it? This is just of eight of these prophecies, the probability of fulfilling one person. Well, Peter Stern worked this out. Take the state of Texas where we are. I spent a wonderful week here one night. And, <laughs> you know, Texas is so big and everybody's proud of it. There was this Texan in Russia. And he was bragging about how big Texas. He says, you can get in a train in Texas, travel for seven days, and you're still in Texas. And the Russians said, oh, mister, I know what you mean. We have the same problem with our trains. <laughs> but he said, you take the entire state of Texas, two feet deep of silver dollars. Take one silver dollar, put a little red check on it. Then throw it in, mix it all up, everything. Then take and blindfold a man, say in El Paso if you want to, no importa, se habla espanol or no. And let him start wading through the two feet deep of silver dollars in the entire state of Texas. Just randomly, one minute, one hour, one day, one week, one month, one year. Just waiting around. And then he just randomly stops, blindfolded, reaches down, and picks up a silver dollar. Takes his blindfold off, and the probability it'd be the check silver dollar is the same probability of only eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in any one individual. But the greatest prophecy was all, of all is in Ezekiel 36, 26. When God prophesies, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I am a walking example of the accuracy and fulfillment of that prophecy. I returned from Europe trying to write this book against Christianity. This was one of seven major things I couldn't cope with. I tried everything because Jesus was not a part of my future. Not at all. I got back, I couldn't sleep. I go home with a friend of mine about 9.30 at night on that December the 18th, December the 19th, 8.30 at night. And I became a Christian. <laughs> Somebody said, how do you know? I was there. <laughs> it changed my life. I got along with this friend and I prayed four things that literally transformed my life. I believe in a relationship with the God who became man. His name was Jesus. I said, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. The most humbling thought I've ever had, and I still get chills thinking of it. If I were the only person alive, Jesus still would have died for me. Second, I knew the Bible was true. I've debated it in over 250 universities. But I had a problem. There were things in the Bible I didn't like. For example, every time you'd say something like, for all have sinned, come short of the glory. I didn't like that. I thought I was a pretty nice person, unless I was mad at you. But I knew the Bible was true, and I knew the Bible said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I didn't know what that meant. You have to understand, I was brand new in all this. I wasn't even a believer. And so I just said, God, whatever that means, I confess my sins. But you know what? Pastor, even then, and this had to be the Holy Spirit, I understood that God forgave me not based on anything that I did, but that what he did on the cross. I understood that. Third, again, I knew the Bible was true, and I knew the Bible said, but to as many as received him, not to as many as went to church, not to as many as sincere, not to as many as been baptized, not to as many as taken communion, not to as many that didn't divorce their wife, whatever, da, 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 da but to as many as received him, to them gave you the right to become a child of God. Now, what in the world does that mean? I didn't know. So I just said, God, whatever that means, I do it. I receive Jesus into my life. Take over the throne of my life. The last thing I prayed was just something like, just thank you. 
Nothing happened. I mean, well, I felt like I was going to vomit. Uh, I thought I was going to toss my cookies. I hear these people say they came to Jesus and they're overwhelmed with joy. I came to Jesus and I wanted to throw up. And I think for two reasons. And I remember this one, boy, instantly, the moment I prayed that prayer to invite Christ into my life, my immediate thought was, Josh, have you made an emotional decision you will later regret intellectually? And it scared me. Second, and this is so dumb, I was afraid of what my friends would say. Here I just learned that if I were the only person alive, Christ still would have died for me. He wanted to place a new spirit and a new heart within me. He wanted a relationship with me. He wanted me to spend eternity with him. Now try to figure that out intellectually. And I was afraid of what my friends would say. How dumb can you be? Well, I guess I was dumb because I had a reputation to uphold. But in about six months, a year, year and a half, my entire life was transformed. I just want to close with two areas. One, my father. I wish to God I'd grown up not hating my dad. I don't care who you are. You grew up hating or despising your father. You will pay a price every day of your life, and I have. Even becoming a Christian does not erase it. I wish I hadn't grown up. I wish I'd grown up with a father like my children have. I was in a very serious car accident. I transferred from Kellogg College to Wheaton College. They called my father. He thought I was dying. They took me home after several days of intensive care, 127 miles in an ambulance. I'd been in a very serious car accident and they strapped me on a board and placed me in bed because they were fearful if I moved or anything, I could further damage my, sever my lower neck and my lower back. And so I could hear the ambulance leave. In about five minutes, my father came and stood in the doorway. I couldn't turn and look at him. All I could do was flash my eyes. And I saw two things. One, he was sober. I don't think I'd ever remember seeing my dad sober. And you know, it wasn't when he was drunk that was bad. It was that interim period between his first drink and about 10th drink. That's when he was mean. Once he got drunk, he was docile or just easy to handle. Second, I saw he was crying. Whoa. The only emotion I'd seen my father, and he was mad at my oldest brother, Wilmot, or my mother. He walks into the room, paces back and forth. Side, I'm standing there like this, trying to follow him in my eyes. And he stops, and he leans right over the top of my face. And he said, son, how can you love a father such as I? I said, dad, six months ago, I hated you. I despised everything you stood for. But I've come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, and I've learned one thing intellectually. And that is, God became man, his name is Jesus, and he is passionate about a relationship with you. That's Exodus 14.3. He gets up, he walks out. I thought, wow, way to blow your first witnessing experience. <laughs> About 45 minutes later or so, he came back in, sat down in the bed, he said, son, if God can do in my life what I've seen him do in yours, and I won't give him the opportunity. Ooh, you talk about joy. Most people don't have this much joy in their entire lifetime. I had it in one moment. Right there, my daddy prayed with me. I call it a farmer's prayer, very down to earth. It was just something like this. God, if you're God and Christ is your son, and if he died on the cross for me and can forgive me for what I've done to my family, and if you can do in my life what you've done the life of my son, then I accept you as my Savior and Lord. Forgive me. All I know is my life was changed in six months, a year, year and a half, and still being changed. The life of my father was changed right before my eyes. It was like somebody reached down and turned a light bulb. Don't get me wrong, I've never seen it before. Such a rapid change. Usually it takes place several weeks, a month or two. Or my father only touched alcohol, alcohol once after that. As far as I know, I cannot remember if he went through withdrawals. He must have after 30 years of drinking uh, two to three bottles of wine every day. He was a wino. But in that 14 months, scores of people in that little tiny town going out about 100, 150 miles committed their lives to Jesus Christ. 
because of the changed life of the town drunk, my daddy. Three-fourths of his stomach had to be removed. Three-fourths of his stomach had to be removed. His entire liver was destroyed through drinking. When he died, it ticked me off. Because I figured he drank because I wasn't a son worth having a conversation with. And I figured he up and died like that because I wasn't a son worth staying alive for. Now all that's stupid, but that's how young people process. So when I went to the university, I was bitter. Second, when it came to Wayne Bailey, the man who raped me for seven years, every single week for seven years. After I trusted Jesus, I had to tell someone. Now look, half of you here have been sexually abused or raped. Half of you, men, women, probably more. Then you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't been sexually abused or raped, you won't know what I'm talking about. I had to tell someone, but here's the point, and some of you understand this. I wasn't looking for help. I wasn't looking for counseling away. No, I just wanted someone to believe me. That's all I wanted. It hurts to be rejected. So I ended up going to the man who led me to Christ, sat in his office for 45 minutes, and I couldn't say it. I got up to walk out, and I thank God to this day, I stopped and turned around, just blurted it out, and he believed me. It was like being born again again. For six months, he mentored me out of the scriptures. I would meet with him. He first would listen to me the valley of the shadow of death that I was walking through every day. This close to giving up all hope. Never seen a light in the end of the tunnel. And then he'd take the word of God and speak it into my life. And for six months, I saw my life change right before my eyes. My feelings, my emotions, my attitude, my behavior. Somebody says, why do you have such deep convictions about the Bible being true? Very one, two, one. Intellectually, and you see this afternoon, whoa, it's gonna blow your mind. Intellectually, why well, believe it's true? I don't just believe it's true, I know it's true. Second, it's changed my life. That's called convictions when you get those two together. When that six months was over, I knew he was going to say it. Oh, I didn't want to hear it. You would have said it. Pastor, you would have said it. So insensitive. He said, Josh, you need to forgive him. I said, no way, I want that man to burn in hell and I will escort him there. But I had a problem. I knew the Bible was true. And I knew God commanded me to forgive, so I did it. But I want you to understand, I had no goody-goody feeling. I want that man to burn in hell. I did it out of obedience, by faith. Believing God commanded it, and if I obey, he will honor it. So I drove 40, about, 44, 45 miles up to Jackson, Michigan from Battle Creek. Knocked in his door. And when he opened, I didn't waste words. I said, Wayne, what you did to me was evil, very evil. But I've come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And I've come here to tell you. Now, what I told him, intellectually, I knew it was true. Emotionally, I did not want it to be true. And I said, Wayne, I've come here to tell you. Jesus died as much for you as he did for me. I forgive you. If I hadn't have done that, it would have destroyed everything in my life. I know people, there's probably some of you here who hated your dad. He died 20 years ago. You still hate him. He's controlling your life from the grave. How dumb can you be? I mean, how many people I meet that others control their life because they don't forgive? It doesn't affect the other person, it only affects you. And to think you have somebody that died and you're still angry and upset and mad. That person controls your life. And I decide no one's going to control my life but Jesus and my wife. <laughs> and they both are pretty close. Jesus might inch her out a little bit. Another thing that helped me is when on my own, it was the Holy Spirit had to leave when I realized. Now think of this, folks. This is true freedom. And God had to have taught this to me. 
There is nothing in my life too great for God's power to deal with, nor anything too small or insignificant for his love to be concerned about. That set me free to trust him with everything in my life. Another thing that happened, again by the Holy Spirit, had to be because I didn't have the counseling for it. I made the decision. I made the intellectual decision. I am not a victim. No one can make you a victim unless you let them. I don't care what they've done to you. No one can make you a victim unless you let them. And I refuse to let that man make me a victim. I'm creating the image of God with infinite value, dignity, and worth. And I will not let that man take that away from me. I am free. And then when I realized I can get in trouble with this because so many people don't know their Bible. One of the smartest things ever did when I realized I need more than Jesus. I need more than Jesus or I wouldn't be here today. I believe parents that teach and pastors and Bible teachers, well, all you need is Jesus. I think that's from the book, of, from the, the destination of hell. When people teach all you need is Jesus, they do more harm, destroy more relationships than almost anything else that's ever taught. Boy, are you quiet. And if you think I'm a heretic, then you are, because I'm biblical. When it comes to my salvation, all I need is Jesus. It's not Jesus plus works, Jesus plus is there. All I need is Jesus. But almost everything after my salvation, I need more than Jesus. I need the church, the body of Christ. I needed Jim Simpson, Paul Lewis, Dick Day, Henry Cloud, Steve Arterburn, and Faye Logan. Without those six men, if all I needed was Jesus, I wouldn't be here. Because it'd be outside the will of God. When people preach all you need is Jesus, they cut people off from God's greatest source of healing. You know, you look in the Bible, it says if we confess our sins to God, he promises forgiveness. You know what it says in James, if we confess our sins one to another, healing. I bet you never realized that, did you? 29 times in the Bible, one another, one, confess your sins one to another. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians. I needed these six men to help bear my burden because it was too great for me to bear. Love one another. Instruct one another. Be patient with them one another. As soon as you say all you need is Jesus, you cut people off from all those scriptures and the power of healing through the body of Christ. Now I'm going to get some angry emails, and you would disagree with me, and all I'll do is answer you back and say, why don't you read your Bible? That's all I have to answer back. I don't have to defend it. The Bible defends it. One another, one another, one another. What? Can two walk together? One sharpens another. Without that, we aren't sharpened. Folks, I concluded intellectually. Now, it was a letter of the Holy Spirit, I know, that Jesus is, the Bible is, and he promised a new spirit and a new heart. There's books out there that can help you. There's the one that, with a movie that's won just about every award and film festival out there called Undaunted. This is probably the first Christian movie that deals with Sex abuse, rape, alcoholism, and family violence. I recommend you use this with your children or grandchildren starting at 10 years of age. I would do it at eight with my kids. You say, well, they're too young. I want to protect them. Then show it to them. The average age of sex abuse is 10 years old in the church. They say, I want to wait until they're 18, 20. I want to keep their purity. You never help anyone through ignorance. You help them through knowledge. See, no one gave me permission to tell someone. You owe it to your children, your grandchildren, to give them. You can use this film. This can open up conversation slings. You say, well, I'll just tell them. Yeah, but they need to visually see it. And in the book, 77 frequently asked questions about God and the Bible. Took the 300 questions I've been asking 1,260 universities around the world, narrowed it down to the 300 most difficult ones, and Sean and I picked out 77 and wrote this on the eighth grade level. It's 
so we can all understand it. It can help you pass your faith on. And then, of course, evidence of men's avert. I wish every family had that. Folks, thank you for the privilege of being here today. And, oh, do I look forward to the 2 o'clock meeting. What you're going to have here in front has never, ever happened in this town, I'll tell you. You're literally going to be able to see, touch, literal, physical, historical evidence that the Bible's true. No one's ever promised that to you before. I do this afternoon. And if you come and you're disappointed in any way, you get your money back. Thank you.